Good evening, and welcome to the first intellectual publics of fall 2023, coming to you from the Graduate Center at CUNY. Uh, my name is Ken Whisaker, and I direct the program along with Chelsea Largent, who in addition to her work here and teaching at CUNY, is finishing her dissertation on future forms of feminists. Tonight, we have a fabulous conversation with our guests Tristan Terramino and Rachel Kramer Bussell, who have worked together and in parallel, pioneering, pioneering genres of feminist thinking, erotica, pornography, and sex guides over several decades. Having come of age myself during the conversation over what was then called sex positive feminism and the discussions that led to and followed on the 1982 Barnard Conference on Sexuality and the growth of lesbian and queer cultures that came after and through the HIV AIDS crisis, I can remember encountering them both in the pages of the Village Voice, feeling grateful for the new languages they were creating. Tonight's conversation is on the occasion of the publication of Tristan's memoir, A Part of the Heart Can't Be Eaten, the story of her childhood, her time at Wesleyan and the Voice, exploring her own sexuality and a lot of other people's, and becoming a writer and filmmaker. Her parents had split from the beginning with her father leaving Tristan and her mother on coming out, hosting her in many visits to Provincetown and sadly ending up dying of AIDS related causes. If you've seen the fantastic interview that Tristan did with Jezebel that posted over the weekend, you'll remember the interviewer noting, we have a second generation queer story told in the book and saying how special that is. It was my honor and privilege to work with Tristan on the book in my role as an editor at Duke University Press, like working with Ruby Rich or Greg Tate or Thulani Davis, getting to publish the people who I learned from and admired is a true dream. So I'm especially looking forward to our conversation tonight. Tristan Terramino is a writer, speaker, sex educator, host of the podcast Sex Out Loud, a former syndicated columnist for The Village Voice, she is the author of numerous books, including Opening Up, A Guide to Creating and Sustaining Open Relationships, Down and Dirty Sex Secrets, and The Ultimate Guide to Anal Sex for Women. She is the founding editor of the Best Lesbian Erotica Anthologies, editor of The Ultimate Guide to Kink, BDSM, Roleplay, and The Erotic Edge, and co-editor of the feminist porn book, The Politics of Producing Pleasure. Taramino has won four Lambda Literary Awards and eight Feminist Porn Awards, among many others. She lives in Los Angeles. Uh, Rachel Kramer Bussell at rachelkramerbussell.com is an award-winning editor of over 70 erotica anthologies. I can say how much work that must be. Uh, author of the Craft Guide, How to Write Erotica, and editor of the personal essay publication, Open Secrets on Substack. Uh, Rachel has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Salon, The Village Voice, and numerous other publications. She teaches essay and erotic uh, writing workshops online and consults with writers via eroticawriting101.com. Uh, Rachel and Tristan will talk for about an hour and then we'll take questions, which you can put in the Q&A. The chat is open, but it will be much easier for Rachel and Tristan if you would only put questions for them uh, in the Q&A. Rachel? Hi. Um, so my first question is, what, what made you want to write this book or have to write this book now versus at an earlier time? Because it closes about 20 years ago. Um, so you know, you've had that time to consider this and some of these things you've written about before, but some you haven't. Yeah, so the book does, um, it it ends when I'm about, uh, It's it ends in about 2001 when I'm about 31. Um, well, first, if I, if I wrote a story about my whole life up until now, um, I'm, I'm 52 years old, it would be a 700 page book. And even though, <laughs> Duke was incredibly generous when they published this book. No one's going to, you know, publish a, a 700 page book. Not for me anyway, maybe for someone else. So it, I, it, it quickly became obvious that like there needed to be two books or maybe even more than two books. Um, you know, I, 
I, I talk about this in the acknowledgements that I thought about writing this book probably within a year of my father dying. So that's around 1996. And I was ready to sort of like actively get started back then, but, um, but my depression and my grief were really consuming most of my brain space and most of my life. So I sort of put that idea aside and then it, it always was kind of like sitting on my shoulder, you know, when you're thinking of projects and you're starting a new one and you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? It was like always there. And I would sort of look at it and then disregard it because, um, I don't know, like a little bit of denial, a little bit of, I'm not, re- I'm not ready to go there. Like I'm, I'm really, truly not ready to go there. So, um, just before COVID hit, I, 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 I said, like, I'm going to do this. I, I, yeah, it's time. I'm going to do this. And then once COVID hit, um, I had the ability to do rewrites and to do edits because I had a lot of time on my hands, like a lot of people, um, because I basically had no work. And your father's memoir, which is woven throughout yours, um, you did not, you had the manuscript, but you didn't read it for a really long time. Can you talk about that decision, both to not read it and then to read it and then how you came to use it in your book? Yeah. So there, there, so I actually tell the story of him giving me the, the unpublished memoir, giving me the manuscript, um, and then me not reading it. This is when I was about, um, I think I was 19 or 20. Um, and I think I I had heard this sort of bits and pieces that his childhood was really difficult, that his mom was quote unquote crazy. And, um, and I, I got, I got a sort of a picture of what it was like for him growing up, but it's really different when you read the details, which are pretty startling, um, and intense. So I think I was avoiding it again. (laughs) I feel like I I just sound like I'm in complete denial about everything here. Um, we'll get to a question where I'm not in denial, but, (laughs) um, yeah, I think there was something that felt after he passed that like almost felt too heartbreaking to read it, to like actually hear his voice in my head and not have him there to talk to about it. So I began, I sat down and began reading it as I began writing my memoir. And I mean, a couple things popped out right away. You know, there are a lot of um, patterns, you know, within his book, um, there's talk about uh, mental health, specifically that my grandmother, his mother uh, was undiagnosed bipolar until very late in life. And she was abusive and uh, that, and, and so that's a, a thing that, that has been handed down that was handed down to both of us. And the other fascinating thing is just reading about what it's like to grow up in the fifties and sixties as someone who thinks they might be gay um, and how long it took for him to come out, it came out in 1973. And, and I began to sort of see like parallels in some cases, in terms of family stuff. And then I also saw this big wide gap of 20 years, because I came out in 1991. And, you know, the title of my coming out chapter is My Closet Has No Door. So you can gather that it was, uh, I had a very different coming out experience that was super supportive, that was joyful. I know everyone doesn't have that, but um, it was really quite the opposite of my father's. And I thought, you know, there haven't been a lot of things written about two generations of queer people from the same family. So I think this has to be, this is part of my story, but I think it also has to be part of my memoir. I'm, I don't know if you know the answer to this for your father, but for you, because hearing you say, you know, that you learn things about him, even though you were very close and talked, I'm sure, about some of these things. Um, 
I'm curious if writing your memoir was cathartic for you and did you learn about yourself? And I don't know if he ever talked to you about like how the writing process helped him grapple with those challenging things that he was writing about. Yeah. I mean, he talked a little bit about it in that he wanted so much to sort of get it down on paper. And at that point, he was estranged from his entire family. So there weren't any feelings to hurt for him writing all those things, right? Um, but I mean, I think the process of writing the book for me was 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 all the things. Like it was cathartic. It was terrifying. It was easy. It was hard. Um, it it brought up a lot of things, you know, not just old memories, but old wounds and grief and pain. And, you know, when you go back and sort of examine these relationships in your life and how they may have sort of gotten you to where you are, sometimes that stuff is not all, you know, rainbows and, and unicorns. Um, at the same time, I don't, you know, people have asked me for, for years and years, like, how did you become Tristan Terramino? Like, did you grow up on a lefty commune? Did you have sex positive parents? You know, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, I, you know, I grew up in a suburb of New York city in a nearly all white high school, public school. Uh, it was really unremarkable actually, but as I started telling these stories and putting it all together, the fact that there were gay people, um, queer people, lesbians, um, non-binary people before that word existed in my life since I was born. Then I got to hang out with a bunch of queer people in Provincetown. Um, also, you got the ferry to go to the gay part of Fire Island in my hometown. So when you put those pieces together, at some point, it, it seems like I couldn't have ended up anyone but me. I like that. Um, along the same lines, one of my favorite parts of the book is your college advisor, Claire Potter, tells you when you're struggling over law school rejections, right, um, that you actually don't want to be a lawyer, you want to be a sex writer. And like, that was really mind blowing to me. First of all, I, I think when we met or right after that, like I was in law school at NYU, and I later dropped out. And that was that was a long time ago, but it's like still, I'm like, oh, would my life have been totally different if I had gone in that direction? Um, but I think that's just such a rare gift for someone in an advisory role like that to advise someone to go into a career path that is not really a career path to most people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't even think today, I mean, and I know we're going to talk about like what exists options for writers I mean there it is more of a career path but it's not like most people are majoring in sex writing I mean I don't know awesome if you are like awesome if that exists as a major but I, I want to know more about like how did that set you on this career path and like what did that open up for you in your mind first of all and then like you know choosing to to do that yeah, it's, I mean, it's a remarkable story and I'm really blessed to still have Claire as a part of my life. I just was on her podcast and, you know, she, she changed the trajectory of my life. I really do believe that. And in this case, I mean, there was really two parts to it. One was that I knew that there were people writing about sex. Like I was not groundbreaking in that, right? I had read the work of Joan Nessel, Carol Queen, um, you know, Judith Butler was certainly writing about sex and gender, um, Susie Bright, Patrick Califia, people, the, everyone who was in On Our Backs. And so I knew that there were sex writers in the world, but they didn't seem like they were making money doing that job. Right. And so the idea that she would sort of propose that I could do that as a job was just kind of outrageous when you think about it. Right. I mean, it. it asked, yeah. And so it, it asked me to take a risk that that's how I felt about it at the time. She asked me to take a risk and then she backed that up by saying, I think you're really good at this. And I've seen some evidence of it, right? Like I've, I've seen your, your undergraduate um, 
thesis and I, I think you're, you're good at this. So it was, um, you know, it was a moment when I could have reapplied to law school. I end, I ended up getting off the wait list to go to, um, Boston university. And I obviously didn't go. And so for me and you like law schools, like produced sex writers, <laughs> and that's just a side benefit of going to law school. You too can become a sex writer, but you have to go to law school first and hate it. Um, so yeah, I mean, she, I think she saw something in me that I couldn't see which is what like a great mentor does, right? A great mentor steps back and says, let me tell you what I think might work here. Um, and that's, that, you know, it's, it's, that's the definition of an amazing teacher. And, and she is, she was, and she is an amazing teacher. I, I just thought that moment like stood out, not that necessarily you would not have become who you became without that, but not at that time you know, it seems like, it seems like you were like genuinely planning to go to law school or like saw yourself as that, right? Oh, am I frozen? You're not frozen, but maybe Tristan is. Okay. Um, um, what was I going to say? Um, well, I will read a little um, section that also stood out for me, if that's okay. But, that sounds great, thank you. Um, because I think woven in with the sex writing is a lot about mental health in the book. And um, there's a part where they kind of, this is towards the end, but um, they converge and Tristan is talking about trying to live up to that public persona that uh, that, that she created. Um, um, and she writes, this is, she's um, starting to, to be known in the sexuality field. And she writes, people were beginning to recognize my name, which felt thrilling, especially in a city populated with such brilliant media makers. But there were times I didn't live up to my own height. It appeared that Tristan Taramino was having nonstop sexy fun, which didn't leave any room for me when I struggled to get out of bed in the morning. It was lonely. I began to cultivate a skill I learned from my mom. Smile, though your heart is aching. I tried out ways to turn on the sexpert when I was in public, something I can still do. I can feed off the energy of an audience to fuel and propel me, but it's temporary and becomes more difficult the older I get. And that really stood out to me because I think there, there can be a dichotomy between what people think a sex writer is and then, you know, being an actual fully complex person who is not a sex writer all the time and is not a, a you know, like they have a whole other life. Um, Tristan, I was I was reading this part where you say it appeared that Tristan Taramino was having nonstop sexy fun, which didn't leave any room for me when I struggled to get out of bed in the morning. And um, you're talking about this um, split kind of between your mental health struggles and this persona that I thought was really interesting. And I was curious if you can talk about um, both that kind of dichotomy for you and then now in this memoir being very open about your mental health struggles and how that feels for you to now have that out in the open yeah sorry for the technical difficulties um I don't know what's going on I'm not at my own house the internet um you know I I think I said this in the interview in in Jezebel um that I just I really had a lot of shame about my mental health. And also I want to put it in a context that like, this is 1995 or six. Um, I, I was diagnosed in 93. And 
there weren't, I mean, the amount of activism and dialogue and like memification of mental illness and mental health, I mean, is, is, has skyrocketed since then, right? Like I could get a shirt that says I'm depressed and people would be like, how ironic, that's funny. Look at the design, right? Like, I mean, I could get that in many different styles. Um, but that was not the case back then. And I didn't know anyone else who was depressed. I know people who went to therapy, but no one talked about being on medication and so I really kept that part of my life really, really separate, but I couldn't reconcile it in any way with, as you said, this persona that I was building, right? This, this person, Tristan Taramino, um, who seemed to have a very abundant, sexy kind of nonstop fun life. Um, the truth is when everything is, the planets are aligned and my meds are working, I do have that life and I'm really lucky to have that life. Uh, but when, when things aren't going well, I am, can be like very low functioning and how do you, how do you back then, especially incorporate those two things? Like I'm, I'm thinking of, um, I like. I don't know how this happened in the universe, but Maria Bamford, who's a comedian, her book came out the same day my book came out. She has, she has a memoir um, and she's a real offbeat, quirky. If you don't know who she is, find her immediately. Um, and she talks very, very openly about her mental health. It's in all her comedy. So it's throughout the book um, and her struggles are right there. And she somehow manages to make it really, really funny. And so- you know, she's made a name for herself on being mentally ill, which is, you know, pretty impressive, right? But I don't know if that was possible when I first started having depression. I, I think that that's possible in this moment. And I love that she exists and so many other public figures are really out about their mental health. But back then I felt super alone. Do you feel like, even though what you just said, like that, that things have progressed in terms of openness around mental health, there is still kind of a, not stigma exactly, but do you feel like there's something people want out of someone, uh, the public wants out of someone who has a career like yours, like as a sex writer, as a pornographer, like, are they looking to you to sort of be, I don't know, an entertainer primarily, or a, a, I don't know what the word is. You know what I'm saying? Like a yeah. that persona. Like, do you think those are at odds inherently? Or do you think that people actually do want to sort of see you or and other people like as fully complex people with both of those things going on? Right, right. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I consider myself an educator, but I definitely use entertainment in, in my education, which I think is really important and, and gets you an audience to listen that may not listen otherwise. Um, I, I, again, I think people are showing up as more of their full selves now than they ever have before, but it's still hard for me to kind of combine those two things, right? Like, I, like this book is about a lot of different things. And people ask me like, what is this book ultimately about? And I'm like, it's these seven things that I can narrow it down to. Right. And it's like, it's sex, it's family, it's chosen family, it's queer identity, you know, and, and it's mental illness. And, and it, it all seems like, how does that all fit together? But actually that fits together. Cause that's my life. Um, and so in some ways I feel like I've evolved as a storyteller in that I feel like this, the writing in this book is the most nuanced, complicated, and honest that I've ever been. I think when I go and look back at my Village Voice columns, I have a certain kind of cheerleader for sex vibe. You know, it's all good sex positive feminism. Everything's great. That was fun. This is fun. There's no such thing as no fun. Um, and that was how I was experiencing it at the time. Okay. It, it's true. So it was true, but it also lacked a level of nuance and being able to sort of reflect back, 
right after the fact. Because it was in real time. Yeah, yeah, it was in real time. It's like I go, I go to see Betty Dodson. I take this masturbation class, and then it's like a week later, my piece is due. So, so me writing about Betty Dodson in the memoir is different, and I reveal some of the more complicated things about my orgasms uh, in that than I did when I was writing this column, Adventure Girl, or when I was being Adventure Girl. And. I'm curious, I mean, whether with the village voice or on our backs or or anywhere else, like, because there's been this in the last, I don't know, decade or so, this idea that like first person writing is coercive on the part of media outlets in, in some cases, like this first person industrial complex that, that people are being pushed, writers are being pushed to reveal more of themselves and in more salacious and maybe, um, exploitative ways than they should be but which that may be true um I haven't personally experienced that but I I think that the reverse side of that is that people want people enjoy if if you're that kind of writer you you find meaning in in writing about yourself so I'm curious like did you ever feel pressure either internally or from out, you know, editors or anyone to like go further with your writing or do things just for the sake of writing about them? Or were you, was it more organic? Like I have this abundant sex life and I want to write about it. Yeah, I think it was more organic. So it, it was like, this thing was custom made for me because all I had to do was go on sexual adventures and I was having plenty of sexual adventures. Right. So it, so that far, that part felt really organic. Um, I've never been like asked to do or write about something that I didn't feel comfortable doing or, or writing about. Um, I think that during this process, Ken, who's my editor, like did zero in a little bit on some of the later chapters being a little light, like L I T E. Um, and, and, and because I was using material that I, things I have written about before, um, I, I sort of fell into this sort of voice that I used to write in basically, because it was that time period. And I think he encouraged me to dig deeper and just like, let's, let's just, let's just, let's just scrape more below the surface here and see what's going on. And then that piece of advice, I think made the book way better. So uh, yeah, I've never felt like people are like, no, you have to tell me everything. Um, But I do feel like when an editor challenges you and softly sort of pushes you towards a deeper truth, that ultimately makes your writing better. Um, speaking of editing and being edited, you know, you uh, started out with a zine, which is what, the late 90s? Yeah, uh, 95, 96, yeah. And, and at the time, like, that was a way for people to get their stuff out there when it, there weren't a lot of outlets for it. Um, and then since then, I mean, a whole lot of things happen. Like it, it seems, it, it seems like a really interesting time because I mean, I sort of missed that heyday of th- these like queer and sex positive zines, like, um, and then there was the village voice, which I had been reading since high school. And then we both were writing for, but that no longer exists. Well, or does it, is it back? It, it's sort of, back. I don't even think you can find the archives. I've well, had yeah, what we wrote, it. no, I mean, I think yeah. it came back and then, I don't know, but basically it does not exist um. in the form that it did, but at the same time, there's articles about like BDSM, anal sex, like role-playing on pretty much a daily basis in a lot of mainstream outlets. So I'm curious, like what you make of that, um, the, that track and do you miss that time when things were a little more underground or like do you think that would it be good if they existed also in parallel or was that because um were those like the zines and the other media like was that existing because it wasn't available elsewhere right 
I mean, I think it's a, a both is kind of the answer because. I do think we have come a long way. I mean, when I published The Ultimate Guide to Anal Sex for Women in 1998, people were afraid to look me in the eye when I said the title. I mean, people like people who were salespeople for the distributor and the publisher were embarrassed to even have that book in the catalog. And now it's like anal sex. Oh, yawn. That was in Cosmo like 25 times in two months, right? It's just, it's, they're so blase about anal sex now. And it's like, okay, there was a time when no one would publish it and no one would talk about it um, except like, you know, radical queer feminist press. So of course I like to see dialogue and visibility about things that have been on the margins. Um, BDSM is also one of these. But with that always comes a kind of co-optation, right? And so if BDSM stayed in the margins, we wouldn't have Fifty Shades of Grey and we wouldn't have like a show on Netflix that like doesn't get everything right because no one is kinky in the writer's room. Right? And so you like cringe when you watch it as a kinky person, you're like, that's not no, that's not it. That's not true. That's not how it works. Um, so, so it's like, a, it's like a push and pull, right? That like, you want more people to know about this stuff and you want more visibility. And, and quite frankly, you want it to be normalized, right? This is a thing in sexuality, just like all the other things. But then there becomes a point when people are like, well, anyone can write about sex. Anyone can do this. You know, anyone can write a book about BDSM and only, you know, see a few Wikipedia articles about it and then say, I'm going to put it in my novel. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm curious what you thought of Fifty Shades of Grey because you are in, you are firmly in the erotic novel, erotic writing, and even in the romance genre, um, which to me, it really struck me as like a romance novel with some sort of set dressing. I mean, what, when it came out, like what was, what was your thinking about and how did it affect your career? Well, I mean, I first heard about it because I got a call from like, I don't know, some, I think it was like the Toronto Globe and Mail. It was like some big outlet that was like, what do you think about this book that's been taking off? And so like, I basically had to read it um, to find out what people were talking about. And I was, I honestly, my first and still kind of in some ways thought was like, whoever, I don't know if there was one person responsible for it becoming the it, it, it just like mind-blowing bestseller that it was like just everywhere in the world like but I'm like whoever did that like kudos to them on their publicity you know skills because from the writing and from the they're, they're just like it doesn't really make sense you know like it's not it wasn't better written than almost any other you know what I mean um like it, it's really hard to say why that became the book but it really did become the book like and it, and it's still kind of just mind-blowing um and I mean and it I, caught fire in a way that nothing else has and it literally penetrated the like the deepest like suburban <laughs> enclaves of people that we never thought would be an audience for this stuff and like yes, like, do I think it needed a lot of work? And do I think its portrayal of BDSM is not accurate? I mean, yes, all those things. But at the same time, like, I think it's undeniable. Like, to me, it's kind of like what Sex in the City did for just discussions about sex, it, but even more so, because I think it did. I mean, it definitely impacted sex toy sales, mm -hmm. BDSM interest. And like, I do think it gave a lot of this, women, especially like, permission just to even think about these things that whether or not they talked about it or thought about it before. So on that level, like, I think that is a, a good that it did, but I think you're right at the same time, then it, it became held up as like the way BDSM either should be practiced or is practiced or books should be written. I mean, it, it became sort of then like everything had to be compared to it as like, this model, which, which, I mean, I don't think any book could hold up to that, but especially, <laughs> not that one. but this is a very interesting tidbit. I saw Yael James speak once and someone, I think asked her what books inspired her. And she said, Mancho Sluts. 
by Patrick Lefia. And it was like at a, I think it was at, it was at a sort of mainstream event. Like it didn't seem like most people like knew what that book was, but it was very interesting. So that's okay. That's shocking. Macho Sluts is one of the greatest books of erotica ever written, hands down. I've read a lot uh, by Patrick Califia. And it was written in the 80s um, when Patrick was a leather dyke. And it, I mean, for me, it was like, it was a game changer reading that because to me, I was not reading that as like fantasies. I was like, oh my God, where are these butches who are going to have this gangbang with this girl? Like, where's that hot daddy? Like, are they in San Francisco? Great. Get me a ticket. Um, it, you know, it was like a really formative book. And also it was informed by real life experience. So the idea that E.L. James even saw the cover of that book is shocking to me. Um, this is, well, I, I have a question about that, but I have to figure out how I want to ask it. So I did want to ask you, um, going back to the memoir and just writing about your life, because this is something I get asked a lot about, and I don't really have, like, I always tell people it's so subjective, but you, you told me that you, and I think you said in just about, um, you did vet the content of the book with the people that you were writing about. And I'm curious if that was your decision or something the publisher um, wanted you to do. And is that, was that specific to writing the book or like, were you doing that when you threw out your writing? Because I mean, sometimes I have, and sometimes I haven't. And I think it can be a very weird thing to have to ask someone like, Hey, I wrote something about you. And I've, I've written both fiction about people and nonfiction and it it's awkward. And I, I will also say it's awkward on the other side. Like then, cause I've had a few people mention me and like their erotica and like, not it's, it's, a, it's, it's, I think it's an awkward thing. Like I, I, and as much as I do believe that, that is it Anne Lamott, like, I mean, I think we all do own our own stories and have the right to write about them, but it does get complicated, especially if the person is in your life and you care about their opinion. So I'm curious, like where that came from and how, what that process was like for you to, to send such personal stories to the person you, that, that is in them. It's a great question. Um, and it's one I thought a lot, a lot about because this writing is really personal. And when I write about people, it is often about their gender identity, the sex we had together, our relationship dynamics, BDSM. This is all really intimate stuff, right? So I'm not saying like I went to a baseball game and Jen sat next to me and we sort of like made eyes at each other, right? I don't know that anyone would be like, please don't ever say that about me. But, but I'd say a lot more than that. And I felt like I wanted to do it in an ethical way. And, and also just, I have to, I felt like I had to give people the heads up, like, Hey, there's an entire chapter written about our relationship. Um, want you to hear that from me before you read an excerpt in September, right? So, um, so yeah, I, for all the people that I could get in touch with, for all the people that I could find, um, and some of those people, I, I, I mean, it was like cold calling. I mean, I found them on Facebook and I was like, Hey, we haven't talked in 30 years. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> That's even more tricky. I mean, I mean, it's really it's tricky. It's really tricky. And also, just as a side note, um, one of the people didn't get back to me. So there was also this sense of like, I'm going to take the temperature of like how bad our breakup was. Are you holding a grudge? How long has it been? You know, stuff like that. And this one person didn't get back to me. And I was like, wow, that's a long time to hold a grudge. But Okay. And then I found out later um, that her mom is suffering with dementia and she's the primary caregiver. And so then I was just like, okay, yeah, don't, this is nothing compared to that. This is nothing. But everyone else um, read their pieces and I basically just asked them a few questions. One, can I use your real first name? Two, can I use this picture of us? And Because there are pictures in the book. Um, and three, do you have any feelings you want to share with me? So I'm not saying like, hey, you get the final edit. I'm just saying, is there, you know, is there anything? 
So people wrote back to me and said, uh, yeah, this is how I remember it. <laughs> because I also am willing to take responsibility for a lot of my own bad behavior. Like, I, you know, I was not a great communicator. I was not a great at polyamory. Um, I, yeah, I broke relationship agreements. Like I, I, I behaved badly, quite frankly. I did not have a skill set to, to, do, to do these relationships in my 20s. So they said, yeah, that's how it happened. Um, the majority of people, both lovers and not, told me that they didn't want me to use their real first names, which was hard. And then oh, barely anyone wanted me to use their pictures. So I just want to shout out um, my ex-partner, Red, who was like, you can use my whole name. <laughs> you can use my picture. I'm totally into this. It's fine. I really appreciate just like, Red's openness to do that. Um, and a few other people too, who were, who were like, you can use my picture and you can use my name. Um, a lot of the other people, not only did I change their name, but I also changed, um, identifying details, right. So that, uh, you wouldn't maybe, I don't know if anyone has time for this to go back and figure out who these people are, but if you did, I wasn't going to give you like some breadcrumbs. I was sad that people didn't want to use their first names because, it signaled to me, I didn't feel like judged or shamed by, by any of them for writing this, but you know, there were a lot of concerns. I mean, someone said, I have a really high powered, like fortune 500 company job, and I can't go into the boardroom with people knowing this about my sex life. Or I have a family, I have a multiracial adopted family, and we are already a target in our small town. I can't let this affect my kids and my, my family. So most people said no, um, which is really hard when you're a writer because you have to keep track of all the fake names. And sometimes someone like an editor will say to you, well, what about this person? And I'm like, who? Because <laughs> I've somehow forgotten their fake name. And I'm like, there's no person with that name in my life. Um, so it's hard to keep track. Yeah, yeah a little spreadsheet. Um, uh, you know, I think it's it's one of the trick it's one of the trickiest things about this, right? Is that I am a really public person, and I have no problem telling you in the Village Voice or in this book why I love enemas. You know what turns me on in bed, all, all the things, right? And other people are not public figures and um and are quite private, and you don't want to invade someone's privacy. I mean, I don't. This is not like a tell-all. This is really salacious, but it's just true and straightforward and salacious. Um, it, it's not like a tell-all where I'm like telling tales out of school or people are going to be like, "Ooh, did she, mm, did she wrote that? Um, I, I don't, I don't want to do that to people. Like, I don't know that it's fair to, you know what I mean? I, so I think it's this delicate balance of how do I describe this person and our relationship and our dynamics and our sex, but I don't identify them in a way that they could be identified in real life. But as I work on my second memoir, um, which is my thirties, forties and, and fifties, um, that, that covers my 15 year marriage to someone who is incredibly private and does not want to be written about. And so I am trying to figure out that now. I mean, it's really hard. And I actually think like you were saying like, oh, it's not like we were just at a baseball game and like everything was whatever, like, but, but I think like there are some people who, even if you're saying something positive or at least not negative, you know, like, and it's not necessarily about sex. If they don't, if that's not their kind of I mean, orientation might be the wrong word, but I feel like, like, I feel like to me writing about my life is just what I've literally like always done since I was a teenager. Um, so it's just supernatural to me. And like, it actually, it helps me process my life. But I think for a lot of people that, that it's not the case, like it's very off-putting and, and just like jarring. And it's kind of like, why would you do that? Um, so, so I think like sometimes no matter what you're saying about someone, it, it, it's, it's like, it, it is an awkward thing for them. Um, but I feel like when we're in the realm of sex, because of how sex is treated, you know, 
in the United States, in society, because there's so much shame and stigma and taboo about talking about sex, I do feel like there is a difference. I feel like if I went to a picnic with someone and said, I went to a picnic with someone versus like that person fucked the living daylights out of me, it's different. And people are still sort of like hung up on putting sex in this other category, which to me is so problematic. It's like asking me to tell my story, but not have sex in it. Uh, To me, it's like, how do I actually give you the full picture of of what I want to say and leave out these parts during which I learned things, I taught things, I uh, realized things about myself, I evolved, I you know, I mean, there's so many things that happen during sex. It's, it's also a storytelling device, right? It's not, and I know, you know, this really well because you are like the queen of erotic writing and editing it. And so, you know, sex is also a storytelling device. Like we, we can move the character ahead in some way and we can explore the relationship dynamics or the power in the relationship through these sex stories. So I don't like, yeah, I don't know how I would write it without the sex. That makes sense. I mean, do you think that that kind of stigma around sex specifically, like people worrying, like people would, when I had my reading series in New York, I would film it and put it on YouTube for people who couldn't be there. And every couple months I would get an email, like, can you take this down? Because even though I agreed to it at the time, like I'm, my job is being threatened or my custody or like things like that. And like, of course I would, but it was really hard because I felt like, well, I was proud of it. And then I was like, should I be ashamed of having wanted to publicize this thing that like, to me is a entertaining, you know, like it's confusing. Right. But do you think that that stigma is lessening or, I mean, cause I think we're in a really weird time politically right now where, um, you know, in certain states, especially people, I mean, teachers are like, can't even say that they're gay or have a same sex partner or, or anything or, or kind of anything. I mean, if they're not straight and, you know, so what, where do you think we're going in terms of that stigma? Like, do you think that there'll ever be a time in this country anyway, where, sex is more normalized as a part of people's lives that we discuss the way we would other things. How I learned to ride a bike, how I learned to fuck a cock. (laughs) Yeah. Same thing. Same, same. Um, we are not there now. Um, you know, it is right now it's like terrifying to be queer or trans or both in the United States. Um, people are literally trying to take away our bodily autonomy along with the bodily autonomy of people with uteruses and legislate us out of existence. Um, Partly this is a backlash to all the progress we did make. I mean, certainly when gay marriage passed, that was way earlier than I thought we were going to get gay marriage. I, I really did. Um, and things have just changed dramatically. And with that visibility then becomes this increased hostility. And in this case, hostility being expressed through policy and legislation. And then we also see that the books that are being banned, right? The, the books that are being banned from libraries or, or banned from a, from a you know, elementary school syllabus are most often books by queer people, trans people, people of color, you know, it's, it, it's folks, it's marginalized folks and their voices that get censored in, in these big bands and, and censorship efforts, right? It, they're not here to, to censor like James Patterson and Stephen King. Um, those guys are like safe, they're, they're, they're fine. So, so we're in this terrible moment, right? I mean, you know, it occurred to me that like my my book could be banned in Florida, for example. Someone could get their hands on it. I'm sure could... it will be. People <laughs> know I, about it. I right. mean, it's almost like this, like, they're like, look, there's like this, you know, like they, they, they almost act like it's like, oh, like this thing that they're trying to like play gotcha. But I'm like, people know it's in their book if it's in their book. I mean, sometimes right. it's not actually like there's like some 
thing going around recently on Twitter about like this children's book that was not actually about gender, but people were like, oh, well, they said literally the, the book said they, because it was referring to like two or more of these animals or whatever. And they were like, well, it's a they. So, you know, it's about, I mean, it's about, um, you know, non-binary people. And and I think there's just such a lack of um, literacy around just reading in general with these bands. Um, but I think you're right that people don't want to hear that queer people exist. They don't want to hear that, um, you know, sex is like a thing that people do. <laughs> well, especially that like that, that we do it as queer people and how we do it, I think is also, um, it's, it's so far outside heteronormativity as to be like probably illegible to some people, like some people and then I like, think, what is this? And I'm like, that's sex. What do you mean? And then I think the idea of like not being ashamed about it and not having that shame is, is like probably one of the most offensive things to them. Cause I yes. think that if, if you were to write about like having maybe had a like wild past sex life, but you disavow it now or something like that might be okay. But like what you're doing, you're saying not just the opposite of that, but you're, you're, I mean, there's a chapter anal sex made me, right? Is that the, that's yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> little play on words, anal sex made me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, I think you're right. There's a certain narrative, which is like, I sowed my wild oats or I was like, just crazy. I was a sex addict, which doesn't exist. And, um, and now I am a suburban, you know, husband or wife and I've fallen in line and maybe even found God, right. That would be the ideal in, in America. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, I think it's hard for them to fathom that my story continues I'm, I'm in my fifties. Guess what? I'm still a dyke. I'm still kinky. I'm still having dirty sex. <laughs> um, all those things, I'm still polyamorous. Like all those things are still true. And, uh, I don't know that they're going to radically shift in, in the rest of my life, but it's also just a kind of red herring in some ways, right. To just, to shut, to try to shut down these conversations. And I think it parallels to me, it parallels sex education in this country, which is that our form of sex education is withholding critical information from young people, right? And so I don't want to make it as passive as, oh, they don't, they don't teach stuff. It's not inclusive. They don't even mention masturbation. It's all about abstinence, right? I, I think it's more active than that. I think it's active withholding from, from teenagers and young people. And then they literally don't know how their own bodies work. And, um, and so withholding the stories of queer and trans folks from young people who could find a book at their library, who could read it at the library, like maybe, maybe they're afraid to take it home, right? Maybe home is not a safe place for that book to fall out of their bag. Um, but who could read this and say, oh my God, like I'm, I'm not alone. And wow, this, this opens an entire new world for me. And also I am, I'm sort of beautiful the way I am. And, you know, young people who are queer and trans need to hear that more often. And that voice that says that needs to shout louder than the voices that say, we don't want to give you health care because you're trans. And I also think it's interesting going back to kind of the media landscape, like, yes, sex is in very mainstream publications, but online, especially on social media, there are fewer ways to say certain things. Like, I, I mean, I, almost every sex related company that I follow has been shadow banned or threatened with that or or tamed down what they're doing in the face of that and I know you said like you you worry about like your Instagram being shut down and you know there's no real recourse if that happens and I think you know tech was supposed to be this this freeing of of information but but it, you know I think there's been a backlash there too yeah I mean 
so it's like if the internet is the public square, right? And we're saying, and, and the internet has everything, you know, you can Google it and it's there. <laughs> There's something there. Hopefully it's also like accurate information. Uh, but if, if that's the public square, social media is the doorway to the public square. And it is being blocked when you are a sex educator, when you're a sex writer, when you're a sex worker. I mean, all these folks who are who are having their their um, accounts shut down. And so in some ways, like you're you're out there and you have an amazing site. Like let's say, say like Scarlet Teen. Heather Corinna founded this amazing site, Scarlet Teen. It's sex education. It was initially geared towards young people, but I literally recommend it to every single person I know, no matter their age, because it is the most comprehensive, the most inclusive, the most trauma-informed, the most sex-positive information about sex on the internet. And yet, because of words they use, because of the word sex itself, they are constantly in danger of not being able to even say, this is what we do on our site. And so to me, it's like you've blocked off a section of the library now and, and, and there are people making decisions who are moderators or who are Mark Zuckerberg, who are saying, you can't go into that section. You, you can't read that. And that's pure censorship, um, which is I, fucked up. I, I, I don't I, have anything else. I, to say I, know, I also like, I, I never really understand it from business perspective either, like the way banks crack down on sex workers. I'm like, uh -huh. don't you want that money? Like, I don't, I, I don't quite understand where I understand where the right wing people are coming from, but like the businesses that don't want anything to do with sex, like doesn't really make sense to me from a business perspective. I mean, I think this gets back to something you said a little earlier, which is like, will we ever will we ever sort of stomp out shame and stigma and taboo about sex? Like um, and I feel like, you know, the roots of the white folks who came and colonized the United States, um, are puritanical, like they had really deep religious puritanical views. And that is baked into the DNA of people here who are born here, um, and, and grow up here. And so there's this streak of, of morality, quote unquote morality, right? Like I, I know what's amoral and it's like, Hey, I run visa. And so we're going to decide who gets to process visa credit cards. Right. And so like you people who do gambling and you people who do like, well, scams, um, we'll, we'll run those cards for you, but you sex workers, no way. So there's all this sort of, there's sex is just completely wrapped up in religion, in morality, in puritanical values. And, and, and so the question is like, will we ever stomp it out? I don't know. I feel like we make progress in some cases. And then we, it's sometimes three steps forward, five steps back. You know, I mean, if you asked me, are there less people in the world right now ashamed of their sexuality than there were when you started this in the late nineties? I don't know how much the needle has moved. I don't really? know. Yeah, I mean, the shame that people have around sex is very, very, very powerful. And that carries over then to people who are in power and can actually like write policy and dictate, you know, what happens. I mean, I I often feel like when people react to you, do you have this, this experience where like you tell someone what you do and people react in this like really strong way that almost doesn't, it's almost like their reaction is, is not at the level of like what you just said. It seems too, too much. And I feel like people reveal themselves in those moments. Like they have got some shit about sex that they have not worked out and they want to project it onto you. <laughs> they want to, uh, dismiss you. You know, they, they want to, they're, they're, they're working out their own shit. And so they can't even listen to what you're saying. But Do you for, have that? Yes. But also I think there's the opposite, right? There's the people who you don't expect to be interested in your work or your, what you do. And, and they are. And I think that's sometimes my own judgments. Like, like I met someone through a family friend, 
who's like in their eighties and was like, Oh, can I read one of your pornography books? And I was like, sure. And then like, there was someone else and they were like fighting over like the one book that I had brought with me. And I was like, I, I will get you another one. Um, <laughs> um, uh, um, what was I going to say? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what I was going to say. So I want to, I do want to ask about you, you were talking about writing a second memoir, which I think is awesome. Um, and like you're 52, I'm 47. I feel like for me, and, and I don't know if this is just like, this is across the board, but like, for me, it was definitely easier to write about very explicitly about my sex life when I was younger. I don't know if that's because I didn't, it's not that I feel shame about it now, but I, I feel like I want to protect my privacy more now um, than, and at the time, it's not that I didn't have privacy around certain things, but I, I, I didn't, I enjoyed writing about it. Um, and granted, like some of that for me is being in a long-term relationship, I, I just like with someone who is a lot more private, like I, I, would not do that to them on a regular, I have written about our sex life, but not all, I don't do it like all the time, partly out of respect for that person, but also like I have, I think I've changed and I'm super glad that I did it. Um, but I don't necessarily like if, if like the village voice, which Elizabeth Zimmer, former, former editor is on this chat and said that oh it is God. online. It's at villagevoice.com. Now, I wish they did put up the whole archives, but like literally if they were like, would you write your column again now? Like I, I probably would not, maybe I would if it was like all journalistic, but I wouldn't do it in the same way. So I'm curious what you think about like aging and the kind of first person sex writing you've done. And I think there's like a paradox because I would love to read more about people's midlife and older people's sex lives, which yes, there are some people writing about that, but not as many as people who are younger. So like, I'm curious what you think about um, how aging has impacted your desire to write about your sex life, like in that real time way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, of course, sex is sort of inextricably linked with this idea of youth, right. And, and that young, like, well, young people, once they have not been educated and have become 18, um, they live the most vibrant, you know, adventurous sex lives, right? When you're young. And then once you get old, it's like everything just sort of stops. Um, and so I agree with you that I think there needs to be more visibility, period, about older folks um, writing about their sex lives, writing their stories, because we know that people are living longer than they've ever lived before and they are having sex in those years at the very least they're apparently reading your erotica <laughs> the 80 year olds but i know some 80 year olds having sex so um so to me like there is no it's almost like there is no beginning and end i, I get the sort of wanting to have more privacy but that train for me has left the station. <laughs> and so I can't like shove it back onto the platform now. I, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, I mean, I still feel, I also still really feel passionate about writing about it. You know, I remember the, the publisher of the Village Voice when we were there, Don Forst, uh, at the end of a meeting said to me, do you think you'll ever run out of things to write? And I wrote my column for almost 10 years. And I said, no, I definitively 100% no. And I haven't run out of things to write. I mean, I haven't. Um, I feel like I'm still learning new things. Uh, I am re-exploring dynamics that I explored in my 20s. And then my, my identity shifted and my desires shifted. And now I'm sort of like going back to something and it doesn't feel like a retread. It feels entirely different with 20 years experience. Um, so I, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep being this way. And, and I also think there's so many reasons to pull back from it. Um, but those of us, I, you know, I have a lot of privilege. Um, and so I have, you know, I'm, I'm white and educated and middle-class and I appear able-bodied and um, I can 
pass as straight for people who are nearsighted. Uh, but, but so I have a lot of privilege. And so I feel like for those of us with this kind of privilege, we, we have to come out and be role models for other people who can't, you know, people who are living in the deep South, who are polyamorous people who are into BDSM and they are school teachers, you know, folks who just can't be out about certain elements of their lives, which may be very important to them. I feel like because I can, I, I need to, because I want to make space for people to ultimately, you know, find out what their true desires are and then go about getting them. And in terms of writing, writing about sex and having sex, like what, is there a correlation, is there a relationship between those two? Like, does one, I mean, you talked earlier about like, you know, when you were writing for the Bill Joyce, like you would have the adventure and then you would write about it, but did the writing change your sex life? Or did the writing inform, you know, whether, I, I don't know, in whatever kind of way? I mean, I think sometimes when you look at something, even if it's, you only have a week between when it happened and when you're writing it, um, you look back at something and you begin to kind of peel away some layers that when you were there in the room, you had a certain experience, right? And you could narrate that experience. But when you then look at it from a slight distance or a long distance, you can see details that you didn't see before, uh, dynamics with a person that uh, you may have felt on some level, but couldn't really articulate. Like you, you can see stuff when you look back at it. And, and so, I, you know, so I think, what was your question? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, my question was, is like, did, did the writing. Oh, writing affect my sex life and my sex life. Right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, digging around in your desires and your fantasies, you always learn something, right? And we are all able to dig around in our fantasies uh, and desires. But when it's your job, you're doing it on a regular basis. So it's like you have a regular practice of what, what am I into? What do I want to do next? What do I want to do and write about? And so you develop this sort of practice of, of being a really good communicator with yourself about what you want and what you like and what turns you on. So I think in that way, that's how writing about sex has affected my sex life um, is just that I, I have sort of above average skills in figuring out what I want because I've done so many things and then had to sort of explain is the wrong word, but had to document them for an audience so that they made sense at least. Um, and that gets you then kind of thinking. So I, I think that's how it's affected my, my actual sex life. Um, for someone who maybe wants to write about sex, whether for like professionally or just sort of one off or once in a while like what advice what skills do you think that they need to have um and what advice would you have for them or things that you wish you had known before going into it because I do think even now when yes there are people who there are more people maybe who can make a living at that than than there were it's still a career path that you still have to, I think, carve out, like, it's not, it's not so simple as to just like say, okay, I'm going to write about this and, and that become my whole life. I mean, there's no like institute for sex writing that you can graduate from, right. Or be trained in just sex writing. So yeah, you're right. It's, there's no, there's there, while it is easier and the internet has shifted things dramatically, there's still, you still have to hustle. I mean, you know, in some ways, it's like we, we lived in New York in the nineties, which is like, for me all about hustling. I mean, just nonstop. And then like bars that we read in where people could still smoke <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like we've, we've all had these, we've all done these reading series. You did one right where three people show up and you're like, okay, here we go. Um, 
And so, yeah, so I don't know that it's like a, a straightforward career path for people. And I think, you know, people have to think about privacy, their own privacy, as well as the privacy of others. For example, I write under my own name, um, as do you, but many writers in this genre use pseudonyms for good reason. Um, there are many ways in which um, this could come back to affect other parts of your life, whether it's like a custody dispute or your job. I mean, you said this earlier, right? So thinking about, thinking seriously about whether you want to use a pseudonym or you want to use um, your real name. And then I think figuring out kind of what you want to say about sex, right? Um, it's like sex for sex sake is fun, but we're at a point now where, you know, there are people like Tina Horn, for example, who is like a sexual public intellectual, if I can like bring it all back, um, who writes about sex in a quite cerebral, um, overeducated literary way. Um, and so we, we have developed a space now where there is incredibly good sex about writing. So you, you kind of have to step up your game. That said, that's professionally. Personally, I mean, some of the best, hottest sex stories you've ever read are on your phone, right? I mean, sexting is like a gold mine. People who are, for example, not sex writers are like, mm, but I could sext you, right? I could tell you, I could spin a little tail here. I could whisper in your ear. Um, and so the idea that we can communicate in this way, which I think started, you know, in AOL chat rooms, anyone who's in their 20s here doesn't know what that is, um, <laughs> that we can communicate, you know, by by sexting and by writing each other erotic stories. I, I, I that can only, I think, help you connect with a partner and um, and you don't have to be a professional to do it. You really only need a few words, actually. And you could just recycle those words. <laughs> do you think, I mean, or not, do you think, have you experienced any like negative, any backlash for doing what you do? Um, or, and if so, like, how do, how do you handle that? And, right. and I, I mean, both professionally, like you talked about, like being uninvited from universities, but also personally, like, have you ever had someone who maybe didn't want to do something with you, date you or have sex with you because of, you know, I don't know, they didn't want to be written about or something. Right. I, I, well, I, know. I, I mean, mean, if some, I, I would, I would, I would like people if they first meet me and they don't want to be written about to say, Hey, just so you know, I know you do this thing. I don't want to be a part of it. And I'm going to respect that. Right. So yeah, I would just get consent uh, to say, Hey, we just had this wild adventure. Can I write about it and, and publish it, right? Not just write about it, but publish it. Um, I've forgotten the question again. Will they cut this? Have you had out? like negative? Oh, backlash, backlash. Okay. So, so there has been no backlash yet about this book. Um, so, but it's really early days. So we'll see uh, what people have to say about it both within the community, within these communities that I'm in, as well as, you know, it's like almost fun to have a quote from like a right-wing conservative saying like, this is the most depraved thing I've read in a decade. It's like, slap that on the cover, right? I was just going to say like, <laughs> <laughs> slap that on the cover. Um, so, but I have a, had backlash in my career. And, and the truth is it has mostly come from my work in porn. Um, that people call me a porn star and use my work in porn to discredit all my entire body of work, right? So I, I am not credible in talking about sex education and talking about feminism and talking about pop culture, talking about gender, um, LGBTQ stuff, like they, they will dismiss that out of hand by saying, but you were in porn. And they think that's going to hurt my feelings when it's, I actually did. Do, I made porn. I was in porn, and you can't shame me about that. Do you think it's because you were in it even more than directing it? Like, do you think that that's the? 
I mean, I think it's both. I mean, I, you know, I dedicated a decade of my life to making it. So, so you can't be like, oh, she dabbled in some erotic film in her thirties. I mean, I, you know, I, I became like almost a full-time pornographer. So I think the making and the being in it, I mean, for, for, for porn, for anti-porn feminists, the making it and the being in it are, are one and the same. Those two things are collapsed into bad, always bad. So that, in that case, it doesn't matter to them. Um, we have a question actually about sex writing. Um, Lauren asked, you mentioned Tina Horn and the banning of sex workers from financial platforms. Can you talk about your relationship to sex work and how sex workers have influenced the field of sex writing? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so I have been a sex worker. I've done various kinds of sex work. Obviously I've been in porn, so that's sex work. Um, I've also escorted, I've also done phone sex. Um, and I've done a lot of like naked and sex still photography. Um, I haven't done it in a while, but that doesn't mean I won't do it again. Just want to let you know, <laughs> there's a price for everything. And I know what my rate is. It's just different now than it was then. So, uh, I would consider myself now like a sex worker ally. Um, and you know, some of these sex worker memoirs that are out there um, are really, really good. And I don't want to say, oh, well, sex workers automatically are better writers about sex because writing is a craft. But sex workers have an opportunity to look at the complexity and diversity of sexuality in a way the average person doesn't. They're having more sex with more different kinds of people or erotic exchange, let's just broaden it, right? And that gives you like a really fascinating perspective. I mean, it's almost like a little bit of market research, okay? Like what is everyone coming in and asking for? What do people, when I, when I say it, like flinch at and say, no, 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 we can't go there, right? You can like literally kind of take the temperature of your particular client base and, and know what's going on with their desires or the desires that they're sharing with you. So I think some of the books on sex work, um, We Too is a great book. Uh, Antonia, uh, Antonia Crane has a book called Spent, which is about being a stripper. That's a great memoir. Uh, yeah, I think they're, I think they're producing some incredible sex work. And of course, you know, Tina Horn is also a major player in that world. And I think what you just said is really interesting about like it, being exposed to so many, no pun intended, but like, but I would imagine, and I have not done sex work, but I would imagine, and from based on things I've read that sex workers are having sex or exchange with people who they might not necessarily seek out in their own personal life. So, and, and I would also imagine that some of those people are the same people that we were talking about before who were doing the book bans and who were like publicly saying one thing and privately doing something totally different. Well, yeah. I mean, the hypocrisy around sex is also just, I mean, it's, it's just sort of like a part of our culture now, right? Like someone every week who has been adamant about abstinence only, who has been adamant about, uh, you know, the immorality of queer people and, and, you know, taking away a woman's right to choose. Like those folks are always finding themselves with their pants around their ankles with a sex worker, you know, at a truck stop bathroom. I mean, that, that it's, it's so common now. And then paying for like their mistress's abortions. And oh yeah. And paying for their mistress's abortions, but you got, you have to love that. Uh, that hypocrisy is runs deep. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I, I think that Again, this gets back to the sort of puritanical ideas about sex. And there's so much shame about even seeing sex workers, right? There's so like people come to sex workers, but they have to get over a certain like hump, hump to like even see them because there's so much shame and stigma with, um, with having transactional sex for money, which there shouldn't be. So I, so, so even there's a whole bunch of people who actually want to do it, who, who, who haven't gotten there yet because they can't, because they feel so stymied by the stigma. 
And that's also, you know, when you are consistently working with people who have shame around their desires, because often people go to sex workers because they're going to, they want to do something or have something done to them that they can't do in their personal life or they can't do with their personal partners. Right. And so meeting those people and working with them and seeing just what feels so taboo about their fantasies. I mean, I think sex workers know things that regular people don't and, and their writing reflects that. Um, you talked about people wanting to see sex workers and feeling that kind of shame. And, um, I'm curious around anal sex. Do you think that the stigma around that has changed? Are people more open to trying it, whether what, in whatever kind of way, I mean, whether with a partner or using toys or other things like has that, and you mean, you also talked about how, yeah, like in the book, publishers were like, or, or booksellers were like, I don't think anyone would go up to the counter and like ask for this or, or, or even show it to the clerk. Like, you know, so how, how has that evolved? Well, the story, that's a really good story, uh, just about publishing and what was going on kind of in the late nineties, which is that my publisher was like a queer feminist, uh, you know, press that was like all for, you know, my anal sex book, right? They were like, hooray, it's great. And then you have a next level of gatekeepers, which are the book buyers and the book sellers. And that's what actually like gets your, your books into bookstores. And if they don't like your book or they don't understand what your book is about, or they haven't, someone hasn't like gotten your, their ear to tell them about your book, or if they're like morally offended by your book, guess what? Your book's not going to get carried in stores. Um, so it's like important to keep these folks happy and on your side, but at the same time, I got a ton of judgment from people saying like, I can't believe this book was written. I can't believe it was published. I want to tear the page. I mean, someone said, I want to tear the page out of the catalog when I really? do sales calls. They're like, I'm just not going to refer to it when I do a sales call. I'm literally just going to skip it. You're saying because they felt weird about it personally, or, well, or I think they might justify it with, I don't want the other person to feel weird, but that's just like a projection that they felt weird. So yeah. So, so they would say all these things. And again, like Amazon was in its infancy. And so, you know, there's a famous quote that someone said to me that's in the book, which is a, a, a buyer, a, a book buyer for bookstores said, we don't know if this whole buying books online thing is going to work out. <laughs> which is like, you know, famous last words, right? It, it it worked out. Maybe it worked too well because now we don't have enough brick and mortar and physical bookstores and we don't have enough independent bookstores. Um, but Amazon has now dominates the the book world and the publishing world. And it's like, if you, you can't have a book and not be on Amazon, basically, you know, it's like when, it's like when musicians try to sell tickets outside of Ticketmaster, you know, they take a stand because Ticketmaster is fucking bullshit and their fees. And then it's like, it, they can't do it. Ticketmaster has a complete monopoly on it. So, you know, Amazon has for all intents and purposes, a monopoly on the book world. Um, and now we know you don't have to go to the counter. You literally order it on your phone in the, in the privacy of your own home. And also you don't, I mean, I don't remember exactly when ebooks started, but I think this is predates your first book, yeah, right? Yeah, no, there were no ebooks. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the other thing is that like, you don't need to own a physical copy. Like it can exist just on your personal device and not, no one else has to know that you are reading that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that has changed the landscape in like what people are willing to sell. And I know you've seen this, you know, there are ebook only erotica books. I mean, isn't there like, you know, audio big, Bigfoot erotica and oh, yeah. you know, like alien, yeah, alien no, erotica and like dragon erotica. I mean, it's like huge. so huge. I mean, it's huge within, I mean, and, and I, I think there, there now are more mainstream publishers saying, oh, look, that's doing really well online. We're going to try to bring it 
here. Um, I do actually have a question along these same lines there. And I don't know if I can like show this, but like, can I show a picture from the book? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. So there's like some, I mean, there's this picture, but then there's like, you know, there's like topless photo. Like I, aside from like a, a um, um, picture. They they, you got to push it way forward for that. Coffee table, table book. There's like some, there's boobs in here. There's, there's, like a lot, there's like nudity in this book. And I was actually surprised because I, I mean, I've read a lot of like sex memoirs. I have not read any, I don't think any with, with like the number of like explicit photos or even any as, and so I'm curious, like, did you have trouble getting these photos, like your publisher to, to put these photos in or were they like awesome? And I'm like, cause like, I'm, I was curious if those same conversations came up around the bookstores being like, oh, well, like we're okay with the text, but then the photos, like that's too far. Ken, do you want to take this? I, <laughs> I do, because it's, it's, it's almost eight, eight o'clock. So yeah. really well time. It actually has a very similar history to the history you're telling about Amazon versus sales reps going to brick and mortar stores. Because <clears throat> for the longest time, like I think when we did Murray Miller Young's book or some of the other books on Linda Williams, the porn studies book, there was still the main printer we used for books. They're like, well, we have child laborers who can't see these things. So it was that same kind of projection. They'd make up like their the student job. We're like, why are you hiring child laborers? Isn't that against the law? So that you would see like there was be no place in the US to get the books printed. So I think the Linda Williams Porn Studies collection with Blanc's piece and stuff, we printed that in Spain. I think a bunch of the other ones were printed overseas. And you know, that was the height of newsstand porn, like, you know, Hustler, blah, 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 and like 14 different penthouse spinoffs and stuff. And it's like, wait a second, like you can go into any airport or any drugstore and find like a million things, but like a university press can't get a book printed. And <clears throat> so I don't know whether what's kind of changed with that in terms of printers and the lack of printers and digital printing. Um, but uh, our former head of production who had been at Oxford for many years, she was like, okay, no penetration, no things penetrating other things. So it's like, okay, just fine. You can show, show your boobs, whatever, but like, no. So that's been like the kind of, here's this line, sort of. So. I know like just about at the time, but Tristan, from your perspective, why was it important for you to have those photos in the book? There's some of you solo modeling and there's others of you, um, you know. It was so cute. Yeah, so. Oh. No, I love them. I'm just <laughs> Yeah, so there's, other, there's others of me having sex. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is a, a sort of prevailing notion that if you have a full frontal genital shot and you see penetration of those genitals, uh, bad shit's going to happen to you. Uh, you know, that it wasn't that long ago that when that happened, like they were seizing stuff at the Canadian border, for example. So all, all of those are, are real. I mean, it, it is an arbitrary thing, penetration, arbitrary, but we live in sometimes an arbitrary world. Um, I feel like if I only included, you know, bad prom photos, which I was willing to include, but I never wrote about the prom. So it was sort of like, sorry, guys, um, I have them. I'm happy to post them on my Instagram. So if I only included these sort of like high school pictures and like prom photos and like professional headshots when I was a writer, um, it's just disingenuous, like with in keeping with the material in the book, right? It's just not genuine. I mean, that's not what's happening in the book. And yeah, there is a still from in the last chapter of the book, there's a still from my gangbang where I'm like sort of splayed out and there are porn, there are porn stars like surrounding me. You showed it. That was the one you showed. Yes, that one. Yes. And, and there are porn stars like all around me. And, um, and I'm just, I, I mean, I'm like sex high, you know what I mean? When you just get super, like, you're just blissed out. Um, and, uh, yeah, they didn't blink about that. They were like, huh? no penetration. <laughs> we'll go 
go with it. But I, and I wonder, I mean, if you think this can, that like as an academic press, you might have a little bit more leeway than something that's under the microscope at like Penguin. I don't know. Do you think that? Probably. I mean, because this is, we've published like serious feminist thinking about it. And we would say that would be the first thing we would say. This is serious feminist thinking about it. Whereas if you were promoting it in a different way, you might have a different opinion. You might have different, you know, some, we struggle to break even, that's our job. So that would be different than if you were trying to like, what's going to get shareholders upset or, you know. Yeah. So are you basically saying like, if I tried to publish an erotica book, not necessarily with the university press, but like where there was like explicit photos that would be less sellable than like a, a serious book? I think for the big, the big guys, I think for like the random houses of the world, they would, I think a bunch of lawyers would get involved and they would possibly shut it down. Um, but I think like Ken said, and, and like, let's talk about the economic realities of, of publishing. Um, Duke is not publishing stuff to make a profit. They're publishing stuff to make, to publish more stuff. Right. And so they have different motivations about what they'll publish and um, what it might include than the big presses who are like, we need to sell the hell out of this. And we also need to appeal to middle America. Oh, and also we'd love to be carried in Walmart. My book will not be available in Walmart um, if you didn't know that already. So um, I, I think maybe Target. There, no, I don't. I mean, it depends on if you read the first few pages, you might be like, this sounds fine, but it's not if you read the book. Um, <laughs> but I think there there's a certain level of freedom that came with working with Duke that isn't just right. about, that's just not about just boobs. It's but if you went off to Tashin, you know, then there'd be a whole different thing. So right. it's sort of like market segmentation in that way too, I think. Yeah. Like you could write your erotica book with all the nudes you wanted for Tashin and get better paper and it would be good. But I mean, like, like, I think it would be amazing if your book was at some of these places, which I do strongly encourage you to shop at like independent bookstores and mm -hmm. bookshop.org and alternatives to Amazon. But I mean, I think like there's a lot of people who would like your book who do shop at those, mm -hmm. those kinds of stores, which by the way, like now sell sex toys and lube and all kinds of things that they didn't 20 years ago. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, it's about five after eight. This has been really great. Now we have questions, as, as I <laughs> predicted, exactly <laughs> at the end. Okay. I mean, um, I can stick around but, for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, people can leave, leave as they want. Uh, Lisa Vandiver, who runs Cine Kink, um, the film festival, um, is asking what you think is the, or what we think is the best way to get out the word about sex-related creative projects. Um, yeah, so this is where people are incredibly stymied by social media, right? I mean, like nearly all my friends and colleagues have had their, uh, their Instagrams shut down or they've been shadow banned, um, or they've had to really fight to get them back. So simply saying, I'd like to announce a project that is about sex and using the word sex is now a reason like to get asterisks. Yeah. Now, now we don't even write. Yeah. We don't write out the word sex. I don't write out any sexual words on my Instagram. Um, and so, and because like TikTok is filled with people like yeah. talking about it and using like Spicy. the fake words, right. Exactly. Yeah. Or sending people to the Insta stories. And if you were looking for more coming out at an older age stories or a million different things that wouldn't have been public before they're on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But you I think it just is just watch people fall, realize they're lesbians in their forties <laughs> Then that you could watch. That could be your whole TikTok. I mean, yeah. So I, TikTok is great. Uh, I am just learning TikTok. So I'll see you all on book talk, but not today. I, I think it's harder for sexual creators to get the word out because right. the censorship still exists. Right. And also if you're having like a gun event with like semi-automatic weapons, please let me put that flyer in my window at my store for you, right? And please advertise on Facebook about that. 
So there are double standards, again, when it comes to sex and, and just publicizing sex events. We, we publicize events of violence every single day. Yes. And I think like, again, like then it can, it can become, and not, not to knock the people that are following you or me or anyone else, but like, I think there's so many more people who would enjoy or appreciate your work and, you know, other people's work that they, they're not going to get exposed to it because, you know, you kind of have to speak in these codes. Right. Right. Well, you both have to speak in the codes. And then this is a big thing for when you talk about, well, what press could get something into Walmart or Target. It's also very kind of the monopoliness of the distribution systems mean, oh, somebody's making this decision for Barnes and Noble. You know, and it's either it's like pay to play person, or right? um, it's a or bunch of different one. people by subjects usually. Uh, so, in fact, where um, your example, the person doing the lube buying could be like a completely different person with a completely different charge than the person doing the how to use the book, how to use the lube instruction book buying. <laughs> Right. So that those could be two different sections and two different buyers with two different standards they were held to. And I think one really cool thing you're you're doing, can you tell us about your um someone asked about your book tour and then you're also doing this collaboration with uh, a chocolate company. So I think like there are opportunities to partner with like-minded people and businesses and get your reach out there more. So maybe we can conclude with that. Okay. So um you know, Life Achievement Unlocked, I wrote a memoir. Second Life Achievement Unlocked, I have a chocolate sex box. <laughs> um, there's this amazing company in New Paltz, New York called Lagusta's Luscious. Uh, all their chocolate is handmade, vegan, ethically sourced, ethically made. All of their employees have um, benefits. It's a great place to work. It's owned and run by a woman. Um, and we, I mean, the way that I got in touch with them was I sort of wrote them a fan letter simply as like, you make really good vegan chocolate. And then she wrote back and said, I'm a fan. And then we got, this was a year ago. So we have this collaboration. It's called the sex box. It's on the website, Lagusta's Luscious. And starting, uh, next week, you could buy the book and the chocolate together. Um, as like a package deal. And um, they did a beautiful job with the packaging uh, there, you know, spoiler alert, there are hearts in there, but there are also vulvas and a butt plug. So if you want a, your own chocolate butt plug, you should probably go there. Also, they ship everything uh, packed in ice and um, they shipped a ton of it to me in California during a heat wave and it, and it survived just fine. So if you're worried about that uh, and someone posted the link, great. Can the whole heart be eaten? Great question. The whole heart in this case can be eaten. It's an incredible anatomical heart. It has this really tart cherry filling that is so tangy and fresh and amazing. It's my favorite chocolate that they make. They only make it seasonally and they made it for me to put in the sex box. And then I'm on tour. So if you want to follow me on Instagram or X, whatever. Uh, if you want to even just go to my website, tristanterramino.com and then go to the events page. All my events are on my Google calendar. Um, I'm doing the East Coast. I'm doing the Midwest. I'm doing the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest. So you can find out when I'm coming to your hometown. Thank you so much. And tomorrow or, and tom Wednesday? or Wednesday. Yeah. For those of you in New York, Wednesday at 530, um, I'm reading at Blue Stockings which is on the Lower East Side. Um, it has a long history of being like a super radical, collective, independent bookstore. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to support them. And I hope I see you there. You have Thank to RSVP you. because it's like limited seating or something. Blue Stockings, where I did my very first reading, I believe for Best Lesbian Erotica 2001. So to, to call back to, which Tristan edited. Yes. And now it's so in a bigger space. Yeah, so and it's 20, 22 years later, we're like, like going to show up right. there. I mean, that's, that's great. Thank you both so much. And thanks, everybody, for coming and sitting through. This has just been really wonderful and appreciate it so much. And I hope everybody has a very good evening. Order some chocolates so they will have good evenings to come afterwards. And uh, we'll be back next month with 
uh, Emily Boone talking about uh, James Van Der Zee and his photographic work as part of the Harlem community, not just as artists, but embedded in the community. And so uh, they pay attention to the intellectual public's feeds and you can get the data and info for that. I hope everybody has a really great night and thanks so much. Bye. Bye.